I don't know if everybody can hear me quite yet. Good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today with God's people to to worship him and praise him. So I am so glad to see you and to have the opportunity to spend a little bit of time together on this beautiful Sunday morning. I know it's hot, but it is beautiful outside. Just look around and see the see the sunshine and the blue skies and uh, just all of God's creation is wonderful. So we uh, certainly have a lot to praise God for as we are together today. I do want to begin with just one announcement I had to pass along, uh, and that's for the Forever Young group, uh, the, and that's the, the group, I'm not quite sure the age, I think it's 55 and older, uh, that is uh, a part of that group that they are planning to make a trip to the Peach Orchard on Thursday, and, and they will be leaving here from the church at 9 o'clock. Uh, we realize that some of you may not feel safe making that trip, being in a, a vehicle or the bus with others. Uh, but if you will let Brenda know, she will also pick up some for you and, and bring that back to you. So just be aware that that is Thursday, and I, I would think that she would want to know if you wanted her to pick up some. Just try to get in touch with her by Wednesday. Uh, so just make you aware of that. Are there any other announcements we need to bring forward today? Well, if not, I want to draw your attention to our prayer concerns and also um, invite you in just a few moments, not just to share prayer concerns, but praises. Uh, but the prayer concerns that I have to share with you, we want to continue to remember uh, the David Pickard family, uh, the Rhonda Kenton family, continue to remember Marty Lindley, and I believe as he was coming in, Vernon was saying he's going to have a test done this week, so let's remember him also. Are there others on your hearts today? Going unspoken. Our nation, certainly. Yeah, there's a lot of decisions that are going on and a lot of unrest, and so we, we definitely need to be praying for our nation right now. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to stand, and we will go to God in prayer. But before we pray, I'm going to read our first scripture. So please stand as we read our scripture for today. Thank you. 
This comes from Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 23. What then? Shall we sin because we, are no, no, because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know when you offered yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have been and have sorry. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit do you reap at the, that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's go to God in prayer. God, we, we give you thanks for this moment that we have been granted to gather, that we who call upon your name and are called on, upon by you, that we are uh, the body of believers, Lord. We, uh, we believe that you are there and that as we call out, you, you hear us. God, we thank you that your gift is life. It is eternal life, but it is a life that begins now. And so, God, as we are here, we pray that we might taste that life. God, we pray uh, over these prayer concerns. We pray for these families that grieve, uh, acknowledging that there is pain that they experience, but also, uh, Lord, continue to redirect them to the hope that they have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, so, Lord, we lift up the David Pickard family and the Rhonda Kenton family. God, we, we want to lift up Marty to you and pray that uh, you would guide all the decisions that are a part of his, uh, his care, Lord, that you would continue to surround him with, with your spirit, with your comfort and peace. God, we lift up Vernon and we pray uh, just for your, your guidance and your, uh, your help in, in this time as he's going for these tests and what, uh, whatever may come of that, Lord, we, we just place it in your hands and entrust him into your care. And then, Lord, for this unspoken and acknowledging that it's not the only one, I'm sure that there are other unspoken prayer requests uh, that whether they were not mentioned or we just uh, they've slipped our mind at this moment, God, we, we acknowledge that there are many other things that we could lift up. And so we thank you uh, that you know those things and, and you care for them uh, before we even knew about them, Lord. You were, you were before us. And then, God, we pray for our nation. We pray that uh, in, in our churches you might build your kingdom and that it might spread out into our nation, uh, that we would see a revival of your ways in our world that just flows from hearts that have been uh, permeated by your presence. So God, as, as we're here today, we pray that uh, you, you might just bring a little more light into our world as we are here with you to experience your light and as we carry it back out into the world after we leave this place. So Lord, we love you. We thank you for this moment to be together. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. second scripture for today it comes from malachi chapter 1 verses 6 through 14 and then following the reading of the scripture we'll enter into a period of open worship a son honors his father and a slave his master if i am a father where is the honor due me if i am a master where is the respect due me says the lord almighty it is you priests who show contempt for my name but you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame and diseased animals, is that not wrong? To offer, try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hand, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors, so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations, from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it by saying the Lord's table is defiled and its food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden, and you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. All right, let's join together in a period of open worship.
God up in heaven. I pray for your people today that you would give us a vision of who you are. Because God, to know who you are, it changes everything. Because you are the one that is above everything. You are the one that is in everything. You are the one that holds all things together. Just a glimpse of your glory, Lord. In the Old Testament, it would have meant death for an individual. But God, we, we've been invited to see you through the person of Jesus Christ. Help us to know your heart. Because as we know your heart, God, we are transformed. We are made new. We become your transforming presence in the world. Not because of us, but because of you being in us. So God, we, we need you. We need you to come and help us to know who you are so that we might live lives that are worthy of you. We might honor you with everything that we do, with every single word we say, with every relationship that we have, with our jobs, with our homes, with every, every dollar that we have, Lord. We want to honor you, and, and that comes from knowing who you are. So God, give us a vision of yourself that is worthy of you. And Lord, that will be enough. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a season where typically we would be celebrating life with barbecues and, and uh, feasts and festivals and opportunities to be together. And uh, I, I just think about those moments. Some of my favorite times are cookouts where, where we just get to spend time with family and friends and to enjoy those moments together. But I want you to think for just a moment. Imagine that you've been planning uh, one of those barbecues for months. And it just slipped your mind. You, you, you forgot that it was coming. And so what, what do you do whenever you have those moments? You don't have the food that's there to, to be served. I mean, in, in, our, in our area, you'd probably run down the Silk Hope store and get one of the, the farmer specials, the, the beanie weenies or the viani sausages or maybe a can of sardines. Uh, and, and that would be what you might serve. But uh, the, the problem is in, in that moment is that you, you weren't paying attention to what was coming up and what really mattered that there was something important going to take place. And so you just have to kind of scrounge around and figure out what you're going to serve. You ever had those moments where, where you had company show up unexpectedly and you, want, you wanted to serve something and so you just found whatever you could. And, and, and I want us to think today about uh, what Malachi's words are, because I think they connect so well to that, of, of what we offer to God. It, this is an invitation to reflect on what we are giving to God. And so I just put this picture up here because I want you to think about uh, the, those moments and, and, and what would be the best barbecue that you could throw or the best feast. Or maybe, maybe you're not a person that likes to grill. Maybe because I know we have such wonderful cooks here. Uh, may, maybe it's something you're going to cook in the oven or the own stove. Uh, just what would you serve? You, you would want to serve your best for the company that's coming, wouldn't you? You, you want to give your best because you want to honor the person that is coming. And so this, uh, this section of scripture that we have read today is about a people who, who have ceased to offer their best to the one that really matters. They've ceased giving to God their absolute best. And so it invites us to ask this question. It's the overriding question of this whole message. What does God deserve? What does God deserve? What, what does he deserve out of your life because of who God is? What, what difference does it make in your life and who you are because God is present in it? What does God deserve? And, and, and our answer, really, there's another question. We're going to back up and look a little bit more at a, a question that's going to shape it because uh, we, we don't know what God deserves until we know who God is. Until we know who God is. And so th this is what we're contending for every single week, every single time we're coming together. We want to catch that vision of God and who he is so that we live lives that are worthy of him. This, this flows out, this whole book, this whole message from Malachi flows out of the question we talked about last week. Or the, the statement that, that God makes to his people first, I have loved you. 
And yet we have a people who are questioning if God really loves them. The question they said, have you, have you, how have you loved us? And so this is a people that are questioning who God is, much in the same way we see so many people questioning God today. You know, we, we, we see it rampant in society. We see uh, leaders that are revoking their faith. We see uh, colleges and we see college students that are, are going away. And the reality is, as churches, have we prepared a generation to, to hold on to a vision of who God is that is worthy of God? Because the reality is when they step out into the world and, and you don't have someone that's directing you to see where God is, you're not going to see him. You're going to miss him. You're going to miss God, the most, the, the most central part of all creation, the one that does hold all things together, that created all things, and everything flows from that being. And so we want to pay attention to that. I, I think that it invites us to pay uh, attention to even our own faith and ask ourselves if, if our honoring of God and the way we love God is, is not just uh, this level of faithfulness, but, but really and truly we, we actually pursue after mediocrity. And I'm not pointing, I'm actually really, uh, I close my eyes right now because I'm trying to look in the mirror and think about myself and, and, and how and, am I someone that is uh, thinking that I am being faithful, but honestly, I'm really pursuing mediocrity. I'm really not giving everything over to God. I'm being selective in the obedience that God has called me to. Being selective in what I am giving back to God. And, and that's the reality. And that's what, uh, how, how mediocrity can masquerade as faithfulness is when we choose to be selective. It's a big problem. Whenever we say, God, we're going to give you a few things and we're going to honor you in this way. But, you know, this place where it's really hard, this relationship where, where, where this person, they just grate at my nerves so bad. I'm going to choose not to love them. That's being selective in obedience. That's being selective in offering our very best because every single relationship. Mary, Mary, Mary called me out the other day. She called me out the other day as, as we, we, we finally have some internet at our house. Uh, we, we finally had it installed, and I was calling and talking to uh, the CenturyLink representative, and I, I was not being very kind because I had been so frustrated for years and years of trying to get faster internet service and asking for it and being on those long calls of customer service. And, and, and so one of, I just I, I, I smarted off. <laughs> I did. I smarted off to him because I, I just had been frustrated and I was so ready just to be done with it. Just cancel the service already and let me move on. They were trying to sell me on keeping their service in some way, in some form. And I, I just, I was, I was past it. And, and Mary looked at me and said, you're a representative of Christ. She called me out in that moment because in that place, I was not being faithful. It wasn't that, that woman's fault that was on the other end of the line. It wasn't her problem, and, and I, I was taking out my frustrations and my aggression, and so that was a place where, where my faithfulness and, and who I am as a pastor, I'm so glad she didn't know I was a pastor. I didn't say anything bad, but it just was the way I said it. But it was mediocrity that masquerades as faithfulness because to say that I'm a pastor and then to treat someone in a poor way like that is not faithfulness. It's not offering God the very best that I have in every moment. And, and, and this is a hard life. L living the life of a Christian is not about you, you pray a prayer and then Jesus is going to set everything straight and it, it's going to be good and you're going to walk down easy street from then on because if, if you look at the history of the church and of the, the Christian faith, honestly, it is more often a more difficult walk to follow Christ. But... When we choose to be selective in our obedience and our offerings, we are honestly being mediocre. And we see, if you get into the scripture, you see two levels of mediocrity. God has his most harsh criticism for the priests. He calls them out by name. But there's also a second level and a criticism that God offers, and that is to the people. But the priests, they receive the, they, they are being mediocre because they are willing to allow the people to give sacrifices that are sick and unworthy of who God is. And, and then the people, the level that they are pursuing mediocrity is they don't care if they're holding back from God their very best. They're choosing what they're going to give to God. 
But isn't that the reality for so many of us, that we choose what we're going to give to God? We, we choose to focus on other experiences and opportunities instead of pursuing after God. I, I heard a pastor that was talking about discipleship, and, and he was saying how uh, so many people will look at him and, and say, you know, I just don't have time for discipleship. And, and, he was, and he was saying, it was a gentleman that was there, he said, well, well, how many of the statistics do you know from last football season? Because the reality is we're giving our time somewhere. Each and every one of us has 24 hours a day, and we have seven days a week. And I realize that you're going to sleep for about eight of those, and I realize that eight hours, five days a week. But even in those moments, even in those moments, that eight hours, five days a week, we can still pursue Christ. We can still show his love. We can still offer that up in obedience to God. And then you have the other eight hours of the day. What do you do with it? I mean, it's so much easier just to flip on the television and, and binge watch a, a, a television show or uh, to, to get caught up in the news. Mary's been calling me out, too, about Facebook and getting on there because as soon as you pull that up, you can, you can waste 30 minutes just like that. Social media, whatever. It's, it's whatever your choice is. We, we can spend so much time in those places. But, but see, I could justify it and say there are Bible verses on here. But honestly, that's not what you see the most of anymore. It's, it's conflict, it's, it's just trials and troubles that are going on. And, and so I want us to think about it. What does it mean instead of pursuing mediocrity that we as disciples of Jesus Christ would pursue faithfulness because these words in the Old Testament, these words that connect us from the Old Testament to the New Testament, they are so important that we pay attention because we don't want to offer up to God beanie weenies. God doesn't he deserve so much more. I'm, and I'm not, I'm not hating on Beanie Weenies. I like Beanie Weenies. I'm, I'm fine with them. That's not to, to make fun of them. I know that so many farmers have been kept alive because of those things. But are we being faithful? Are we offering God our best? If we look at what's going on, we, we might need to pay attention to that. And so these are the two questions. The first one that we need to pay attention to, who is God? That's why we have this. That's why we have scripture, so we can know who God is. And, and it's, it's being in community and reading this together. It's, it's being in this word on our own because it's when we come in contact with this that God's Holy Spirit comes around us and, and surrounds us and, and enlightens us to what this is to show us who God is. Because that's what we get when we read scripture. We get God's presence. It's, I, I've lived my life so long as a pastor and as just a human being thinking about it's, it's the knowledge, it's getting, able, it's getting to the end of the year and checking off the different reading, reading lists so that I've read through. But it, it, I'm trying to change that mindset in myself that it's not about getting the knowledge of the Bible, it's about getting to God. So we know who God is. We find it in Scripture, we find, it, find God in community. And as we grow to know who God is, we begin to offer God what he deserves. The, the problem with, with this second one is that we can be so subjective. Well, this is the best I can offer to God. I'm given what I can. I, I don't have much else. And, and, and I think if that, if that is true about you, if, if you are loving God with everything that you have and, and bringing everything under to his lordship and his control, then, then God certainly honors that. But I want to invite you to consider, are you really pursuing after God? Are you wanting to know God more, to, to love him more, to, to know who he is more every day? And as we pursue knowing God more, and even if it's just a little bit more every day, it, it makes a big difference. Those, those small steps every day instead of giant leaps. We, we in, in our faith, have we, we so often focus on those experiences. And I was there as a, as a teenager. I went to the events as a teenager, the yearly meetings, the, the, the winter retreats, the summer camp things that we participated in, and, and, and I live for those moments. We have those big moments. But what God invites us to is the daily faithfulness, the daily offerings to know who he is because he deserves our daily attention. And so when we know who God is, it, it, it reveals to us what God deserves. So let's go into the scripture. We see this first part, and, and we see two comparisons that God makes of himself. A son honors his father, and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. 
So he's saying these two things he deserves. He deserves honor and he deserves respect. And that word respect, and if you go actually back to the Hebrew, it's the word fear. Remember in Proverbs it says the, beginning, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we want to understand how life is meant to go best, it's by fearing God. And that fear and love of God. And if we fear God, God is the one that's worthy to be feared. Nothing else comes close to who he is because he controls all things. And then we go, it is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. Now, this is a hard message, I acknowledge. And we, we might not want to admit out loud, especially, that we can show contempt to God. But we at least need to look at our, the condition of our own hearts to, to see, are we actually showing contempt to God by how we live? This people that, that Malachi is speaking to, they're not giving God what he deserves. In fact, they're saying that the offerings, are, they're not that important. Giving your best to God, it's not that important. And so they are showing contempt for God. Understanding who God is is the essential piece to that. God deserves our very best. And, and in Malachi, you get a name for God that, that you see more in this, in this book of the Bible than you do the rest of the old, whole Old Testament. It is the Lord of hosts. And so when it says, uh, it says the Lord Almighty, it's, it's this specific name for God, the Lord of hosts. And when it says that he's the Lord of hosts, the, the host in that day were the armies, the other armies that had come in to occupy, that, that had come in to, to take over and had, at one point had carried them off into exile, had, had destroyed the temple, had destroyed Jerusalem. God is saying, I am the Lord of hosts. You, you pay attention to all these things around, me, around you. What you need to pay attention to is me. I am the Lord of hosts. I am the one that's above all these armies that you're so afraid of. I am the one that's over their rulers and their leaders. I am the one that, that directs them. They are subordinate to him. But when we focus on, on everything that it's around us, on, on all the, the, the problems that we see in our lives, instead of focusing on God, we show contempt for God. show contempt for God whenever we, we have that short word with a customer service representative. We show contempt for God whenever we are, are, are short in our own relationships and, and, and as husband and wife or as a, a child with a parent or a parent with a child. We show contempt for God when we don't let God transform our minds and, and change us to be made and remade in his image. That is the, the heart of this, is that whenever we're not being obedient to God, we are showing contempt to God. And, and this is not a call. I'm not saying that everyone has to go out and become a pastor. But the reality is that everyone is called to, to be a disciple. Whenever we're not pursuing and trying to follow after Christ, we are showing contempt for him, because it's when we follow after Christ that he shows us how to live. When we get into the New Testament and we see how Jesus lived and we choose to model our lives after who he was and to love people like he loved them. I mean, that's something our world is so desperate for is to see a picture of love that is worthy of God. And while we're showing less than that kind of love, we're showing contempt to God. This is how they show contempt. It says, when you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now plead with God to be gracious to us with such offerings from your hands. Will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? I want to pay attention to that phrase, talking about, the, as Malachi is talking to them, saying, offer, it, offer those offerings you're giving to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept this? Is, is he going to be happy with what you're doing? There's such irony in that moment because there is, they, they are giving these obedient offerings. It looks on the outside like they're doing everything that they are supposed to do. And, and yet, if they were to go and offer that to the governor, the governor would be like, why are you giving me this? 
Why, why are you saying that this is a good gift? And, and the irony of this is that this offering to a governor, it's not, the, it's not the, the king in the line of David that Israel expected. It, it's, it's actually a foreign power that's come in and is there to rule over the area. The, the idea would ha have been completely unthinkable to offer something like that to, to, the, to the person that's in charge from another nation, and, and then they're giving less to God. Why? Why do we give less to God? Because we don't fear who God is. We, we forget who God is and that he is worthy of our very best gifts. So the irony of these obedient offerings, they, they look on the outside like they're doing everything they're supposed to, but they're giving out of empty hearts that are not filled with God's presence. God deserves our absolute best. The problem here is found in our hearts. Our, our hearts must desire God more. And, and, and I believe that whenever you ask for God, when you ask for God to show you who he is, I believe he's faithful. And I believe that he will make those offerings that we give every single day when we choose to pick up the word. If we say, God, I want to meet with you, he's going to meet with us. It may take time. It may be a struggle to read scripture and, and, and to do it consistently. But I believe as you pursue what God meets with you, he honors that obedience. He honors that obedience. So we, we see here at the end, we, we get a, a clearer picture, and I've changed the color because I wanted to draw attention to God saying who he is and what's going on. And this particular verse, verse 11, would have been very, very controversial for those in Malachi's day. It would have been controversial because the idea is that God is going to move out and he is going to be honored outside of the temple. The temple is supposed to be the one place God is honored. The temple is supposed to be the, the place where God dwells with his people and, and they meet with him and they offer sacrifices. It's the one place on planet earth that it's supposed to be. And so what God is saying through Malachi is that, you know what, if I'm not going to be honored here where I'm meant to be honored, I'm going to move outside. I'm going to go somewhere else. I, I'm going to choose another people. I'm going to choose another place. I'm going to choose different offerings because these right here, they're detestable. You've got blood on your hands, and so let's read. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors. Let's let that sit for a moment. God's saying, shut the temple doors. I don't want any more offerings. For us, I think that this is the invitation. It's that, that we need to stop and pay attention I think about all that's taken place over the past few months as, as churches have had to close their doors. I don't think that that is God saying that we have to shut the doors, but I think it's an invitation for us to stop and pay attention and, and say, are we really pursuing after God or are we pursuing after what we want or what we think God wants? Are we really being obedient to Christ? And so this invitation, where, or not this invitation, this rebuke where God says, oh, that you would shut the temple doors. What doors in our lives need to be closed? What, what things that we give so much attention and so much of our time and even so much of our money to need to stop because they are distracting us from who God is calling us to be? And, and, and this, oh, that you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, and I will accept no offerings from your hands. Here's the reality. This is why he won't accept these things. My name will be great among the nations, from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. God's name is meant to be great. Who God is is meant to be a great presence, and he is meant to be honored throughout all of the world, throughout all of creation. His name is great. And so I'm so thankful that because of what Christ did, that, that we can worship God here. We don't have to make a journey to Jerusalem, to a temple, 
to honor and worship God. We, we have it so easy compared to generations before us. Think about those generations of Jews that had to go back to, to Jerusalem to offer an acceptable sacrifice to God. We, we can offer an acceptable sacrifice right where we are by honoring God, by knowing who he is and what he's worthy of. And you say, what a burden, and you sniff at, the, at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the chief who has, given an acceptable male in his, who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am great, a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. For I... I'm a great king. Not the governor, not a general, a great king. This is who God says he is. This is, this, this is why in the New Testament when Jesus, or when John the Baptist first shows up on, on the scene and then Jesus follows after him and they say that the kingdom of God has come near. It's because God is the great king. He is the one that is worthy of everything. It all belongs to him. He has dominion and he has power over it. His name is to be feared among the nations. And, and, and I think that we've p painted this picture for ourselves of God, that, that God is, is more like a teddy bear than the great king. God, God is a comfy a comfy being that we just want to hold on tight like we want to hold on to a teddy bear, the, 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 comfort, the uh, Linus blanket that he carries that just makes us feel, feel comfortable. And, and the reality is, is that's not the only picture we get of God because God is the king of all creation. And he is to be feared, and he should be feared even among the church because of who he is, because it is what he is worthy of. And I realize that there's much more that should be said and needs to be said on that, but I also acknowledge that we don't have the time today. And so the cure to showing God contempt, and so if we're, if we're going to move past showing God contempt, the cure is to actually know who God is, to know that he is the king, that he is the one that determines every single step that you and I take. That everything that we do is meant to be done in honor of him. That we ask ourselves, that, that we, we learn to ask ourselves, because I don't think it happens in an instant, but we learn to ask ourselves more and more of our lives, what would God want me to do in this moment? What would honor God right now? I've said relationships. I, I, I've talked about that and how that, that's one of the places. So in, in our marriages and as parents, how can I honor God in this relationship? As we're at work, how can I honor God at my work? And, and you may not work at something that's like, like at a church or, or somewhere that it's really okay to be very vocal about your faith, but you can still honor God there. You can still make him known by your work ethic, by how you treat the people around you. The cure to showing God contempt, if you're, if you're going to choose not to show God contempt, it's by knowing who he is. It takes me back to one of, the, one of the things, the young adults, when they first started gathering, I think it was in 2012, we read the book Radical, and, and they had this phrase that came out of that time together, uh, because in the book, David Platt was talking about the idea that, that we look God, the lion in the face, and we'll slap him, slap him in the face, but so often we'll look at kittens, the things around us, and we run away in terror. And so the young adults, they developed this phrase whenever we, we, we started uh, going and we made the plans to go to Jamaica, they would start saying, it's just a kitten. The way, that was the way that we would acknowledge that these things that we're so focused on in the world around us, they're nothing compared to who God is. It's not even a close second. Everything that we see, everything that we can become so focused on right now around us, everything, the, the, the troubles that we face, they're just a kitten compared to who God is. And yet so often we get caught up in those things. It went. So I just want to challenge you. I know that this has been a hard message. It's been a hard message for sure. But I, I want you to ask yourself, who am I believing God is? 
Who am I believing God is? And, and because I'm believing God that way, how am I treating him? Because the reality is what we think about God comes out in how we treat God. What you and I think about God and what we believe about God comes out in what we offer to God. Are we a people that are offering God these blemish sacrifices? Literally, in the Hebrew, the, the people, the priests, have blood on their hands because it's not worthy of who God is. Are we offering up something to God every day, every moment? Not just this 11 o'clock hour on, on Sunday or 1030 to 1130 now in, in this hour of the week are, are we offering God our very best or are we offering up something that's blemished and what the gospel says is that everything we offer is is blemished ultimately but if we pursue after God if we pursue after Christ he will make perfect what we offer to him he will make it perfect. If we pursue after God, he perfects our imperfections. He takes our weakness and he makes them perfect. And so this is the last phrase I want to say. It's that half-hearted obedience to God. It's not obedience. If we're going to be half-hearted in how we follow Christ, it, it, we're never going to know who God is. And I've got, I think Angie's going to come up and sing one more song as we close today. And join me as we close in prayer. I think that's such a fitting song to end our time together as, as we're reminded about obedience. It is that grace that sustains us. Yes, we, we serve the, the great high king, but he has given us grace to follow after him. So let's pray and, and ask for that grace. God, we do plead the grace of Christ. There are times when and days that we We'll, we'll rise up to the occasion. We will do the great things that you deserve. But God, also there are days where we will fail to do those great things. On both, we, we plead the grace of Christ. We plead the grace that, that uh, we know it's not based on what we do that we earn our way into heaven. But we plead the grace on the days that we fall short. Because we believe you are calling us to better. And you will empower us. And you will help us to be obedient because you are worthy of the obedience. So God, may we go forth in grace, and, and as we go forth in grace, may we share that grace with everyone we meet, that they may know that there is a God in heaven that takes broken vessels and makes them beautiful and makes them whole and is at work in our world. So God, we love you. Go forth with us. 
that we may know your grace and make it known. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.